Um, thank you, Gordon, for the introduction uh, and um, also for inviting me to deliver this address to you. But may I say that just as I have no desire to require your professional services, I I'm sure you have no desire to require mine in due course. I am currently engaged in the prosecution of a nurse you may have read about. It isn't gross negligence, manslaughter, but invol it involves the alleged administration of exogenous insulin to a number of patients, three of whom died, one of whom was brain damaged, 17 of whom recovered. It seems a most unhappy coincidence, too, that on the very day that I'm delivering this address to you that I should read in the Times uh, this morning of the charging of two anaesthetists with manslaughter. Um, on screen is a specimen indictment, as it's called. It, was, it is the charge and the charge sheet that you, if you ever had the misfortune to be the subject of proceedings, you would be a B and the patient that you had operated upon who had sadly died would be JN in that document. Uh, but it, it sets out in very short order and in very simple language what is indeed a very complex point. The, the allegation is that you, on a particular day, unlawfully killed your patient. Well, there are certain remarks that are to be found, indeed, in a bulletin that I read quite recently, and you may already be aware of them. They are the following. Every day, surgeons have to make decisions which, if they get wrong, have the propensity to harm patients. Those are the words of Norman Williams, the president of the Royal College of Surgeons in 2014, in an article that was entitled lowering the bar that was prompted by the conviction by a jury of the consultant colorectal surgeon David Sellu, of whom you've heard and of whom you may know already. Now the author was of course at pains to point out that he had not been present in court, he'd not read the court transcripts, and the only facts that he was aware of related to those expressed by the judge in sentencing David Sellu. He observed, therefore, and properly so, that he was not in a position, nor did he think it appropriate to comment specifically on the rights or wrongs of this particular case. And may I say, in case you're tempted to ask me the question later, neither am I. But there were, in his view, certain aspects of the case that, when taken out of context and in isolation, as he put it, merit further comment and provide important lessons for you. As he observed, like you, I come at this as a surgeon who has got up every morning wishing to do the best for my patients and with no intention of doing any harm. Well, that's a sentiment, no doubt, shared by all, although perhaps with some notable exceptions, one of whom I prosecuted many years ago now, Dr. Shipman, but, but on the whole, it is a sentiment that is shared by all. But it's equally shared by every other member of the public who gets up, gets in their car, drives to work, and has a car accident in which there's a death. And it's equally the case that on occasions that car accident that results in a death can result in a criminal prosecution for the death. Now there may be other reasons why um, that the death has occurred. It may well be that there has been dangerous driving on the part of the driver, but that can be a sudden and temporary loss of concentration that was and is characterized as dangerous, that led to a death and led to the prosecution of a perfectly sensible, respectable member of the public. And so, it isn't the case that doctors are being singled out. 
it is the case that what is at the very core of the criminal justice system is the consideration of the consequences of certain acts and whether they are or are properly characterized as being criminal. And as I'll come on to in due course, the reason why now doctors face the almost inevitable sanction of custody as the consequence of being convicted of gross negligence manslaughter is because of a sea change in the law. It's not been a lowering of the bar in terms of liability, but it is a sea change in terms of the approach of the courts because culpability is only one element of the sentencing exercise. It is harm that, it, it, that is at the very heart of the exercise. And the harm where death follows is so serious that it is almost inevitable that custody follows. And so the concern which may be shared by some or indeed all of you was an impression that prosecutions of medical practitioners are being pursued more commonly and that consequently the bar for conviction seemed to have been lowered and that was indeed the very thesis in the newsletter um, by um, the author of uh, the article to which I have just adverted. Well, I have to say that it's an opinion I do not share as a practitioner, and I'll set out the reasons why. The bar remains high and has not been adjusted downwards. It may be that there are greater numbers of surgical procedures taking place. It may be that there's greater transparency and accountability that has led to an increased number of prosecutions, but there is not a lowering of the threshold for prosecution or conviction. And prosecutions are not driven by the victim's families. They are considered calmly coolly and dispassionately and in accordance with guidance that is set out both by the Director of Public Prosecutions for application by her lawyers and also in the directions that a judge would give to a jury in due course should anyone have the misfortune of being the defendant in a criminal trial. Uh, and so let us consider then the offence of manslaughter and the requisite ingredients of the offence. Uh, they've already been dealt with and so I'll skate over them if I may uh, and you'll see them set out. Is committed when death is caused by a negligent breach of the duty of care owed by an accused to the deceased and the deceased was thus exposed by the accused to the risk of death, if but only if the circumstances were so reprehensible as to amount to gross negligence. Well, that's quite a mouthful, isn't it, really? And it's quite difficult for uh, us all to absorb uh, and extremely difficult for a jury to absorb. So in practical terms, it can be set out in the way that it appears on screen now. And there are four stages which a jury would be directed to consider. That the defendant owed a duty of care. Well, what is a duty of care? Well, it amounts to this. Anyone who performs a medical procedure owes the subject of the, the procedure a duty to take all reasonable care for his or her safety and well-being. It doesn't mean to treat them and tr treat them such that the operation or the treatment is a success, it means discharging that duty towards them in that way. It has to be proven that the defendant breached that duty and proven so that the jury are sure of it, not on the balance of probability, but sure of it, each of these elements, that the defendant breached that duty. That means conduct that fell below the required standard, namely the standard to be expected of a reasonably competent and careful surgeon conducting the procedure in question. I'll come on to that because th there is 
in fact, no opacity about that. There is clarity in the directions that a jury would receive, and there is a particular phrase that is, is at the very heart of the submissions that any defence lawyer would make, and indeed any judge would give to a jury in directing them on that test and on four. But at three, the defendant's breach of duty caused the death of the, the victim, of the patient. There may be systemic failings. It may be of great frustration to the defendant that there are all manner of other systemic failings that he or she had to um, and was working within an environment of. But I'm afraid the blame will be focused upon the individual. Systemic failings may be a matter for subsequent inquisitorial process by way of inquiry or any coroner's inquest. But in an adversarial process where proof of responsibility to the criminal standard is, is asserted and is then sought, then I'm afraid the buck stops with you. Finally, four, that the breach of duty that caused the death was gross. And that is the vital ingredient. So what does it mean? Well, let's put it another way. Taking into account all the circumstances of the treatment, in order to convict, the jury must be satisfied so that they're sure. One, a reasonably competent and careful practitioner would have foreseen an obvious and serious risk. So it's an objective test. It's not subjective. It doesn't depend upon recklessness on the part of the surgeon. It's an objective assessment of the competence and the discharging of that competence. But it has to be a foreseeability of an obvious and serious risk by the reasonably competent and careful practitioner, not merely of injury or even serious injury to the patient, but of his or her death. And again, that is indeed a very important element that is sometimes overlooked. And the second element, that the defendant's conduct fell so far below the standard to be expected that the care he or she provided was grossly negligent and consequently criminal. In other words, not that the, uh, that the negligence was gross and whether additionally it was a crime, but whether the behavior was grossly negligent and consequently a crime. So what does that mean? What amounts to gross negligence? Those are really the most important aspects of my address, but also the rubric for any lawyer who approaches a case of gross negligence. The jury must consider the nature of the act that caused the death, not merely the fact of death. It is a very important distinction. The fact of death cannot convert a negligent act or omission into a grossly negligent act or omission. In other words, consequence and the benefit of hindsight do not and cannot convert the act into a crime. What the jury must not do, and indeed uh, it is important that one guards against, is working backwards from the death to the act or omission of the doctor. It is important that one works forward and considers the nature of the act that caused the death and whether that act was gross. Thus, was the act behavior so bad in all the circumstances to amount to a criminal act or omission? And would a reasonably competent and careful practitioner have foreseen that obvious and serious risk of death resulting? Well, here is the important element and it is the element that is driven home to a jury. And it is indeed the reason why, uh, having regard to the rather opaque 
definition of gross negligence manslaughter in the authorities, as Margot um, made the observation, in Prentice, for example, or in Adamaco, the cases to which she were referred, there's a very much more simple and straightforward test. Did the defendant's conduct fall so far below the standard to be expected of the reasonably competent and careful practitioner that the care or the treatment provided was, and this is the phrase, something truly, exceptionally bad? And I reiterate, this phrase relates to the conduct that caused death, not the nature of the outcome because it's always truly exceptionally bad if the patient dies, but it's, the question is the act that caused it. And so it is, it, it is rather further defined in this way because a recklessness isn't required, but it is an important element of, of any prosecution and the considerations by way of satisfaction of the test so far as a jury are concerned did the defendant's conduct show such an indifference to an obvious and serious risk to life as to amount to a criminal act? So there is a working and workable definition of gross negligence in practice. So Adamarco there sets out passages from it together with the test and the height at which the bar is indeed set and remains. But this is not a simple question of proof of indifference, failure to advert to a serious risk, or a breach that may properly be considered simply a matter of negligence that can be dealt with by financial compensation only. That those are not really the, the sort of phrases that a jury are going to receive or welcome. They've had to sit there and have to balance considering the anxieties of the family who await their outcome and the anxieties of the defendant whose career hinges upon their decision and future hinges upon their decision. And they know that their decision may not only destroy that individual's career but also may result in their incarceration. They are reluctant to convict, and they remain so. But what is of considerable persuasion is the fact of death, and it is important, therefore, to guard against it. R rather more simply put, in those cases, um, it is also a reference to that it not being required that there is um, the necessity for subjective recklessness on the part um, of the surgeon. The counterbalance is how indeed the, di the direction may be given to a jury in terms in which a jury may properly and more easily and readily understand. And it's indeed extracted from a decision of the Court of Appeal, Misra and Srivastava, Mistakes, even very serious mistakes and errors of judgment, even very serious errors of judgment and the like, sorry, there's a repetition there, are nowhere near enough, my emphasis, nowhere near enough for a crime as serious as manslaughter to be committed. And there you will see that the standard has to, it has to be falling so far below the standard that it is truly exceptionally bad. In a case at Sheffield Crown Court, again, similar sentiments expressed towards the very bottom, the final three li four lines. You have to be satisfied that the shortfall from a reasonable standard was so flagrant, flagrant so atrocious, that it can properly be categorized as a serious criminal offense, namely manslaughter. And in the Hatfield Rail disaster, because of course, not only are, are the medical profession at risk, a bad error of judgment, complacent or indolent in the discharge of responsibilities. That level of want of care in my judgment does not approach the necessary legal threshold for a manslaughter 
conviction properly reached. And it's um, that phrase, properly reached, that also gives an indication of really why and how it is that the bar remains high. Because it ought to be borne in mind that a jury may only convict if there is sufficient evidence for them properly directed in law by the judge reasonably to convict. So the gatekeeper to being put at risk of conviction is therefore the judge. Thus, these judicial pronouncements as to the degree of the requisite seriousness ought to afford a degree of comfort to the practitioner and the, as to the risk that he or she may fear they face on a daily basis if, sadly, a patient in your care dies. Well, finally, and from a forensic point of view, let us consider certain risks that a defendant faces. You've gone beyond the stage of being arrested or being interviewed under caution. You've been charged. You're facing trial. There are risks. The first is the one that I've characterized as aggregated culpability, and it's important to guard against it. Your lawyers ought to and will no doubt do so. The judge ought to and will no doubt do so. It's important to emphasize with a jury. And it's touched upon as the um, systemic failings that may beset you by reason of the environment in which you are seeking to operate in both senses of the word and properly to discharge your duties, your responsibilities as a surgeon. And so it, the aggregated culpability is where there has been or there can be identified a series of errors, acts or omissions committed by a number of practitioners over a period of time that are unrelated and if they're not jointly made with the defendant, and therein lies the difference between what happened in the case of Garg and to a degree what happened in the case of David Salu. But eventually, whilst in the care of you, the defendant, the final piece of the jigsaw, it results in death. And so it's the principle of the last man standing, then you are the one that, that is aggregated or at risk of being aggregated with the culpability of others. And it's important that you are not and that that is guarded against. The second of those risks is one that's self-inflicted. It was self-inflicted uh, in the case of Mr. Garg in particular because, of course, there was evidence that he had concealed his own conduct by deliberately falsifying documents. Well, the reality is, and although the jury may be directed, that such acts by a defendant do not prove that he committed the offence. They don't establish that the act was gross, which resulted in death. The reality is it could have done him and did do him no favours. There is a natural temptation in certain circumstances to try to conceal or to bluster one's way out of an embarrassing or difficult position. The problem is that you may actually be causing the perfect storm in which you are then the person who is the focus of all the attention and in due course the individual who is prosecuted. And irrespective of how much aggregated culp uh, culpability there has been, your own conduct a jury will consider it in these terms, well, if he lied about it or if she lied about it, she knew, he knew that they had done wrong. What they had done was, just as the judge has told us a moment ago, something that was truly exceptionally bad. That's why they've tried to cover it up. That's why they're guilty. And so it, it is very often a self-inflicted injury. <laughs>
in terms of forensic injuries. And finally, silence in interview. Do, of course, take the advice that is given to you by your lawyers. You can, of course, sit there in silence and listen to the questions and the allegations that are being put to you in any interview under caution. You can then give a prepared statement, which is advisable so to do, because you ought to give a response if you can but there are consequences of remaining silent that are statutory. A jury can conclude that you didn't answer questions because you had no answer to give. You, at that time, had not thought of what your explanation could be. You've made it up since. And so, if there is an answer, if there is a response, it is something that you ought to think long and hard about giving, but only on the advice of your lawyers, obviously. But at the very least, of giving a prepared statement in response to the allegation levelled against you, twofold. First, it is a document that would then be considered by the Crown Prosecution Service before they decided to charge, because, of course, arrest or interview under caution follow, is, precedes any decision to charge. It may make the difference between charge and no charge. And in due course at trial, it makes this difference. There is no adverse inference if your defence at trial is as per the document that you have provided in the interview. So um, there are those safeguards. I, I don't believe that the bar has been lowered. I don't, from my own experience, believe that, that there has been a dilution of the test or that there is a greater preparedness now to prosecute doctors than there was previously. But I think there's a more, there is a greater frequency to it only by reason of the numbers of procedures that are being undertaken on a daily basis. And that's a matter of historical reference and relevance as opposed to any change in the approach. The approach is this in so far as any sea change. If I'm afraid you are the subject of prosecution and if I'm afraid your conduct was truly exceptionally bad and if it results in your conviction. In previous eras then the prospects are that the sentence that would have followed would have been a non-custodial sentence because you hadn't set out to cause the harm when you got up that morning, but harm sadly was indeed caused. The legislation now is such that I'm afraid harm caused is very much the center of the criminal justice system and the sanction that follows. So uh, when you uh, go away this evening, I, I, I hope uh, that you can at least feel comforted by the observations and not disconcerted by the uh, reflections that are sometimes to be found in some of the literature uh, and that the test remains one that is so high that one hopes you never indeed find yourself crossing it. Thank you.